samurai in Egypt. Following the 1863 order to expel barbarians from Emperor Kome, Japanese emissaries embarked on the second Japanese embassy to Europe. Their goal was to persuade France to close the port of Yokohama to foreign trade, and thus close the country to Western influence. The Japanese Tokugawa shogunate, a feudal military government, desired to isolate the country. The diplomatic mission was led by the governor Ikeda Nagaoki from the Ibarra villages in what is today the Okayama prefecture. He was only 27 years old at the time. The group left Japan on February 6, 1864. Their mission produced this stunning image by photographer Antonio Beato en route to Paris. The Beato brothers were a photography duo that popularized the first widely distributed snapshot of the Middle East in Europe. The photo shows the men casually posing in front of the Great Sphinx of Giza. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves of the Metropolitan Museum of Art explained, quote, In 1864, en route to Paris, the Ikeda mission visited Egypt. The stay was memorialized in one of 19th century photography's most extraordinary images. The embassy's members, dressed in winged Kamishimo costume and Jungasa hats, carrying their feared long katana and short wakazashi swords, standing before the Great Sphinx. They returned to Japan in August of the same year after reaching France, but without accomplishing their goal. Wooden Cart Satellite In 1981, the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, successfully launched its first communication satellite, Apple. This photo depicts the high-tech spacecraft two years earlier undergoing tests while being carried on a cow-drawn wooden bullet cart. The ISRO was mercifully mocked for the image. Critics jumped at the opportunity to make fun of the country for transporting the satellite from its high-tech hangar on a cart. For those opposing the program, the photograph captured the seeming disconnect between the nation's deep-rooted poverty problem and the massive expenditure on what many deemed to be a vanity project. Supporters of the project saw the image as a representation of science being carried out, regardless of circumstances, and as a symbol of syncretism between top-notch modern technology and ongoing development. Still, spokesman S. Krishnamurti explained why bullet carts were used, quote, We didn't realize what a fuss that photo would make. Of course we didn't need to use a bullet cart. We have padded air-conditioned transport lorries, but the metal was throwing off reflections affecting the satellite's antenna. Then somebody hit on the idea of a bullet cart, which is made of wood. It worked perfectly. The ISRO, however, was dealt a significant setback in 1992 when the U.S. issued a two-year embargo on selling satellite technology to India. The first Bush administration alleged that India was secretly developing low-temperature liquid fuel not for launching satellites, but for long-range nuclear missiles. Such technology would allow India to launch warheads with greater range. Considering that the country already had the capability and resources to make atomic weapons, the U.S. saw an opportunity to prevent further nuclear proliferation with the restrictions. Part of the fear was that the machinery used for the planned satellite launch could be translated to military purposes. Considering India's less than amicable relation with China and Pakistan, a possible threat seemed realistic to American experts. The introduction of cryogenic rockets would increase India's range and possibly increase tensions with its neighbors. Still, India's space agency director, Professor U. R. Rao, vehemently claimed that cryogenic technology had only been used for space rockets until that point, and that the U.S. was using this excuse to keep India from commercially competing on the space exploration front. Black Confederate Soldier This 1861 tintype shows Confederate Sergeant Andrew Chandler and his slave Silas posing together in uniform with swords and guns. According to family lore, Andrew and Silas grew up together and had a relationship more akin to friendship than owner and slave. When Andrew was wounded in the bloody Battle of Chickamauga, where 35,000 died, Silas helped him return home safely to recover. According to the Chandler family stories, the men, seven years apart, grew up as friends. Andrew Chandler Battle Sr. has stated, quote, Andrew Martin and Silas kind of grew up together and were crawling around on the kitchen floor as children, and they hunted and fished and grew up as young boys together. Research suggests that the widely circulated photograph was taken early in the year when Andrew took Silas to war. While descendants from both men have agreed that Silas played a role in carrying messages and supplies, they disagree about his willingness to do so. Andrew was captured at the 1862 Battle of Shiloh. Before then, the white man wrote a letter to his mother that supporters of the Confederacy have taken as evidence that he cared for his slave. In it, he stated, quote, If the feds were to capture him, they might take him along with them. However, critics and detractors have presented a more realistic alternative. Since Lincoln signed the Second Confiscation Act the previous month, all slaves held by Confederate soldiers were declared free men. If Silas fell in the hands of the Union, he would be free, and Andrew would lose his property. Still, many have referenced the picture to argue that some slaves favored the Confederacy. 
Furthermore, a tale of Silas saving Andrew has been used to fuel these suspicious claims. An 1864 Confederate document suggests that Andrew received a gunshot to his right leg and ankle while fighting at Chickamauga. According to urban legend, the battlefield doctor recommended amputating Andrew's leg. Silas allegedly purchased a crate of whiskey with a gold coin sewn by the slave-owning Chandler family into his jacket for a possible emergency. The story goes that Silas bribed the doctor with the whiskey to let him take the white man home. He supposedly then transported Andrew in a boxcar to Atlanta. The Chandler family's tale is believed to be a somewhat fantastical version of events and has been deemed unlikely by researchers and historians. The story is not supported by Silas's descendants, nor by his obituary in the magazine Confederate Veteran. The magazine would have had a particular interest in releasing the account had it been verified. Additionally, the diaries of Andrew's daughter contain no mention of such a narrative. Myra Chandler, a great-grandchild of Silas, has also contradicted the tale, saying, quote, I never heard that story until Silas came to the forefront on the internet, after the story that was built up to put that iron cross on his grave. I never heard that from my grandfather. I never heard that from my father. I never believed that they would have given a slave money. As for the cross she spoke of, the sons of Confederate veterans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy placed a Confederate flag and metal cross at his grave during a ceremony honoring his alleged military service. The modern myth serves to cleanse the Confederate image and depict the Civil War not as about slavery, but freedom and states' rights. While there were slaves who supported their Confederate masters as servants, the claim that any willingly served as soldiers remains mostly unfounded. After Myra Chandler conducted extensive and exhaustive research on her ancestor and discovered he was a slave rather than a willing soldier, she wrote a petition asking for the removal of the honors placed at the gravesite. The Confederate flag and cross have since been removed. People Zoo, Igorot Village. In the late 19th century, human zoos showcasing many exotic foreigners of the colonies became popular in the Western world. The profoundly dehumanizing and now condemned displays attempted to demonstrate how people deemed lesser by Europeans and colonizers lived. They also served to reinforce harmful stereotypes to justify conquests and religious conversions. Several living exhibits were included in the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair in collaboration with the U.S. government in the Philippines. The human zoo area was 47 acres and trapped over a thousand Filipinos for exploitation and entertainment of Westerners. The most popular exhibit, Igorot Village, featured an ethnic group indigenous to the mountains of the Philippine island of Luzon. They were perceived as one of the least civilized groups and forced to perform to entertain curious white fairgoers. Dressed in minimal clothes, the indigenous group of captives at the fair generated more revenue for their captors than all the other villages in the human zoo put together. Though the Igorot occasionally ate dogs during ceremonies, the behavior was sensationalized in daily performances, much to the Western audience's glee. The fair also featured exhibits of other peoples, particularly from Africa. A Congolese man by the name of Ota Benga was told he would work at the zoo caring for elephants, but he was instead put in a cage himself. A placard outside his exhibit read as follows, quote, Age 23 years, height 4 feet 11 inches, weight 103 pounds, brought from the Kasai River, Congo Free State, South Central Africa, by D. Samuel P. Werner, exhibited each afternoon during September. To attract more tourists, zookeepers placed bones in his cage, and at one point, he was even displayed along with primates. The Ingerot remained popular carnival exhibits after the fair. Showcases toured carnivals and festivals around North America and Europe until the U.S. and Philippine governments banned the practice in 1914 after protests by Filipinos. Nazis in Tibet This photo of members of the German Third Reich meeting with Tibetan and Chinese dignitaries was taken during the 1938-39 German expedition to Tibet. According to German researcher Roger Croston, the Germans were supposedly pursuing, quote, a holistic creation of a complete biological record of Tibet. The trip was led by German zoologist and SS officer Ernst Schaefer, with enthusiastic support from SS commander Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was fascinated by Asian mysticism and had researchers take cranial measurements and facial casts of hundreds of locals. While the expedition has been repeatedly logged as scientific, multiple theories have arisen about a darker purpose for their visit. Some believe that the Germans were trying to learn whether the supposed Aryan race originated from the area. Other theories suggest that they were actually testing the viability of installing a military base there. Some even allege that the strange and out-of-the-way expeditions continued annually until 1943. These more outlandish accounts claim that the group was searching for the Vril, a theorized superhuman race living under the Himalayas who could teach the Germans supernatural powers and secrets. <laughs>